After watching this video, you should be able to describe the well-fed state, including the major hormones, insulin and glucagon, the major reactions, particularly regulation by insulin, and the effects of adipose, skeletal muscle, and liver. So if we go and start with the big picture, and we can see that we have our uh, typical uh, liver cell uh, divided into two parts. Over on the left, we have the fasting state. Over on the right, we have the well-fed state. And if we go and focus on the right side, we can see that we have glucose entering the liver cell through the glucose transporter two via facilitated diffusion. The glucose then gets phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate and then undergoes a variety of different possibilities. We can have glycogen synthesis, we can have the pentose phosphate shunt producing NADPH, we can have the rest of glycolysis forming 2-pyruvate and ultimately 2-acetyl-CoA molecules in the mitochondria. And what happens is that the acetyl-CoA, remember, can be ultimately converted back into fatty acids and cholesterol repackaged as triglycerides and then sh uh, shipped off as very low density lipoprotein. So uh, on the right side here in the well-fed state, we can see that the liver is helping to take up glucose, store a lot of energy as, uh, as, uh, as glycogen, synthesize fatty acids and cholesterol and send that, um, that excess um, to places like ultimately the fat cell that can, that can take up the, uh, the fatty acids and store it as triglyceride. So in the well-fed state, we're in an energy storage mode, and the liver plays a major role in that. Um, we can see in contrast uh, to the fasting state that the liver is producing lots of glucose. We see 2-pyruvate going all the, way, um, all the way to glucose here, and then the glucose goes out of the liver cell um, uh, from a high concentration to a low concentration. And we're breaking down glycogen and, and, um, and breaking down fatty acids. So this is a really good picture to always look at, to put things in perspective about what these metabolic reactions are doing and how they're interrelated to each other. So if we go back to another favorite diagram, this is just a general summary of the major reactions and we can see here that uh, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis, they're all grouped on the right side and their counterparts, well at least most of these are counterparts, are over here on the left. Um, gluconeogenesis is a uh, counterpart is glycolysis the breakdown of glycogen over here on the on the right followed by the uh, synthesis of glycogen on the left and then fatty acid oxidation over here on the right compared to fatty acid synthesis over here on the left um, there's some other metabolic pathways too that are over here on this left panel triglyceride synthesis as well as the pentose phosphate shunt and the important thing to keep in mind about these two sets of reactions is that when one group is uh, turned on, all of the other reactions are turned off and vice versa. And glucagon and insulin, which are the major hormones here, they're going to be working in opposite ways. You can see that the reactions that glucagon turns on over here are on the right side are, um, are, are also um, turned off by insulin. And in this situation, reverses these reactions on the left. So this is a very important, this general summary of the major metabolic reactions and how they're grouped together and how they're generally regulated by glucagon and insulin. Now, speaking of glucagon and insulin, let's go over again as a review uh, what happens to these hormones, in this case, in the well-fed state. And that takes us to a scenario that looks like this. Now, we can see that um, when we're in the well-fed state, of course, our plasma glucose is increased because we just ate a meal. We're assuming there's carbohydrates in the meal. It's a, it's a, it's a carbohydrate-rich meal. And that glucose then can enter the beta cell through facilitated diffusion through a glucose transporter and enter the beta cell. And then there it's metabolized through glycolytic enzymes and that produces ATP for the beta cell. Now, it turns out that when you increase ATP in the beta cell, there's special potassium channels called KATP channels or, or ATP sensitive potassium channels that close in response to an increase in ATP or an increase in ATP ADP ratio. And when these potassium channels close, remember potassium uh, currents are always outward currents in the body. And so when we close channels and we decrease the permeability to potassium, 
we have a decrease in efflux in potassium, and what that does is it depolarizes the beta cell membrane. Or, another way of putting it, the, the membrane potential becomes less negative. Now, as a consequence of that, the voltage-gated calcium channels then are triggered to open because they open in response to depolarization. And when those calcium channels open up, calcium goes down its concentration gradient into the beta cell, and that calcium, like um, in a lot of other cells in the body, triggers the exocytosis of insulin from vesicles from the beta cell. And contained within those, um, uh, those vesicles in the beta cell, there's also uh, the inactive C peptide that's released in equimolar amounts. So the bottom line here is you eat a meal, your blood sugar goes up, there is a very elaborate mechanism to cause calcium influx and insulin secretion. And the KATP, KATP channels play a crucial role in that. And if you watch another video uh, where we go into this um, glucose-mediated insul insulin secretion in more detail, um, you recall that these channels are drug targets of drugs that are used to treat diabetes mellitus. Okay, so these are very important. This is a very important mechanism. Now, going along with the insulin secretion going up, it turns out that uh, insulin itself, uh, as it flows by the alpha cells in the um, in the islets, uh, suppresses glucagon. So the profile, the hormonal profile of insulin glucagon looks like this when we're in the well-fed state. And if you re recall from the, the lecture on the fasting state, all these arrows are reversed and we have a, a decreased insulin and an increased glucagon. So it's exactly the opposite for the fasting state as we have here. So now that we've, we've worked out what's gonna happen to insulin and glucagon, all right, we can go back to this uh, picture again and we can say, okay, uh, insulin's gonna be high, so I would expect that glycolysis and glycogenesis, fatty acid synthesis, triglyceride synthesis, and pentose phosphate shunt, they're all gonna be turned on, okay? And at the same time, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis are all gonna be turned off. And if glucagon levels are low, that all is all, that's all gonna work as well, okay? So, so all the reactions on the left in the liver are gonna be turned on, and all the reactions in the liver on the right side here are gonna be turned off. Now let's take a little bit uh, closer look at what, the, what specific mechanisms are involved. Now this is not a complete list of, of all the details, but it's a good place to start. So what we wanna first do is look at, well, what's gonna be the effect of high insulin? Now there's a number of enzymes that are induced by insulin, okay? We're just gonna focus on the liver for uh, here, um, this first set. Then we're gonna add a little bit about fat and then we're gonna say a remark about skeletal muscle and fat. Um, in the liver, glucokinase, which is step one of glycolysis, is gonna be induced and that's gonna be a mechanism to turn on glycolysis, all right, step one. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which is a very important enzyme in the pentose phosphate shunt, that's going to be induced. That's going to help turn on the pentose phosphate shunt. Okay. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase, that's going to be induced. That's going to help turn on fatty acid biosynthesis. Okay. Now, all that is occurring in the liver. Again, why do we want glycolysis turned on? Because that's going to help the liver take up glucose. Why do we want the pentose phosphate shunt turned on? Well, that's going to produce NADPH, which you need to do reductive biosynthetic reactions such as fatty acid biosynthesis and um, triglyceride biosynthesis. Uh, why do you want acetyl-CoA carboxylase turned on? Well, you want to be making fatty acids because you have a lot of excess acetyl-CoA from, from glycolysis, and you want to sh send that out to the fat cells for, for energy storage. Okay, so all these kinds of things make sense that insulin would be doing. Now, it turns out that in the fat cell, the blood vessels going to the fat cell in particular the endothelial lining, have an enzyme that's induced by insulin. And this enzyme is very important. It's called lipoprotein lipase. And what it does is it cleaves triglyceride-rich particles like chylomicrons from a meal or VLDL secreted by the liver. And it takes the triglycerides in those particles, releases fatty acids, which are then taken up into the fat cell and then restored as triglyceride. So really this fits in with the idea that insulin is going to be promoting fat storage. Okay. Now finally, um, there are some effects in the fat and skeletal muscle that are a little different than all this. 
and it, it relates to the, the translocation of the glucose transporter 4 to the surface. Um, we have this uh, in another video on effects of insulin, so if you want to see that in a little more detail, I recommend you go there and watch it. But the basic idea here is that when insulin binds its receptors on fat and skeletal muscle, these transporters are inserted in the membrane, which helps those cells take up glucose. Now in skeletal muscle, that glucose can be used to store as glycogen for, for um, skeletal muscle contraction. Uh, in the fat, that glucose is going gonna, is gonna to be um, serving ultimately as the sugar backbone to make triglycerides. Okay, so all of this kind of fits together in the effects that you'd expect insulin to be having. All right, now at the same time all this is happening, remember that glucagon is low and that means that the effects of glucagon are going to be decreased. And remember, whenever we think about glucagon in the liver, we want to think pKa. So if we go and look at the effects of pKa, we simply have a situation here where we have decreased effects of pKa. So what that means is that all of these enzymes and all these proteins that are normally phosphorylated by pKa are not going to be. So if you um, go and watch the other video on the fasting state, you'll see that there's a very similar, um, um, uh, sim similar looking slide here where all these um, particular enzymes and proteins are, are phosphorylated and they have a little blue phosphate on it. Notice that that's not the case here. And that's because pKa actually is not going to be going around and doing all this stuff. So um, if we look at this protein here, this bifunctional enzyme, PFK2 fructose bisphosphatase 2, we can see that this um, kinase domain is going to be turned on and the phosphatase uh, uh, domain is going to be turned off and we're going to be making this reg regulatory molecule called fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. And one of the things that this, this, um, pro this, uh, this molecule does is that it's an allosteric activator of step 3 of glycolysis. And so that's going to be a mechanism to turn on glycolysis, is to increase the production of F2,6 bisphosphate. Now, you also know from a, from a previous video that F2,6 also is an allosteric inhibitor of uh, gluconeogenesis enzyme um, fructose bisphosphatase 1. So in addition, that's also going to be a mechanism to suppress gluconeogenesis. All right? Now, pyruvate kinase, which is step 10 of glycolysis, that normally gets phosphorylated by pKa. In this case, it's not going to be. And when it's not phosphorylated, it's in the active state. So we're going to have glycolysis turned on for a couple of reasons here, okay, from lack of pKa stimulation and in the previous thing we looked at, uh, insulin induction of glucokinase, all right? Now, um, as far as gluconeogenesis goes, we said that um, this fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, if it goes up, it suppresses um, one of the gluconeogenic enzymes, but at the same time, uh, cyclic AMP response element binding protein, um, which is normally phosphorylated by PK, is not going to be, and it's not going to be inducing all of our gluconeogenesis enzymes, like PEP carboxykinase and pyruvate carboxylase and fructose bisphosphatase 1 and things like that. So without Krebs being phosphorylated, we're not going to be inducing our gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis enzymes. Now, as far as glycogen synthase goes, when it's not phosphorylated by pKa, it's going to be turned on, so we're going to be promoting glycogen synthesis. And glycogen phosphorylase kinase is not going to be phosphorylated, and it's going to be off, meaning that um, glycogen breakdown is going to be turned off, which is just what we wanted. Okay? We don't want to be breaking glycogen down, we want to be storing it. Now, as far as fatty acid metabolism goes, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, which is not, one, of the, one of the things that can phosphorylate is pKa, if that's not around, it's going to be in the active state making malonyl-CoA, and malonyl-CoA, as you know, um, is involved in fatty acid biosynthesis, but it's also a very important regulator of carnitine acyl transferase 1, which is a mechanism of getting fatty acids into the mitochondria. So this is a way of linking a turning on of fatty acid biosynthesis with a turning off of fatty acid oxidation. And this, we go into this a little bit more detail in our lecture on fatty acid oxidation if you want to check that out. Okay? So fatty acid oxidation is going to be off. Now fatty acid oxidation is off in the liver. The acetyl-CoA that's made from fatty acid oxidation in the liver mitochondria normally is made into ketones. So we're also not going to be making ketones which is um, something that we're supposed to be doing in fasting state, not the well-fed state. Um, and finally, 
for the fat cells themselves, um, there are glucagon receptors on fat cells, and when glucagon levels are low, PK and the fat cell is going to be low, and consequently, hormone-sensitive lipase, which is a PK-dependent enzyme, is going to be off, which means that we're going to be having a decreased release of fatty acids from the fat cell into the blood, which is the normally the substrate for the liver to oxidize. Okay, so we wouldn't want to be um, releasing fatty acids from the fat cell, remember, because we just stored it using the uh, lipoprotein lipase enzyme. Right? So it makes sense that if lipoprotein lipase is on, hormone-sensitive lipase is going to be off. Okay, So all of these um, effects of lack of PKA and of insulin take us back again to um, our, our situation over here where we have a turning on of hepatic glycolysis, glycogenesis, fatty acid, and triglyceride synthesis, and pentose phosphate shunt, and a turning off of gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis. Okay? So if we go back to the beginning where we started, um, we, we said that for the well-fed state, you want to have a good idea what's going on with the hormones, uh, with insulin and glucagon, the major reactions, particularly in the liver, but also a little bit in the fat cell as well. Uh, what kinds of regulation is done by insulin? We, we talked about all the enzymes that are induced by insulin. And then how um, these different organ systems are going to be working together to achieve the effects of, of in this case, uh, high levels of insulin promoting energy storage and, and a reduction in plasma glucose. And that concludes this lecture on the well-fed state.